Hello, and welcome to this National MS Education and Awareness Month conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, and made possible with support from Biogen, Genentech, Novartis, EMD Serono, Sanofi, Beatrice, and Bristol Meyer Squibb. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined today uh, with, with Katrina Bodden, who's here to discuss everything you need to know about MS. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Katrina Bodden is a nurse practitioner who has worked with MS patients since 2003. She started at a rehab hospital and then in 2008 became an infusion nurse at the Rocky Mountain MS Clinic in Salt Lake City, Utah. She became an MS certified nurse in 2009 and it was her love of treating and educating those who are associated with MS, like patients, family members, and other clinicians, that lead her to seek higher education and to obtain her master's degree in 2015. She has been a nurse practitioner since that time, and she finds great joy in enlightening the world of those around her with education and excellent care. She truly believes that everyone can live their best life regardless of the obstacles put in front of their path. We're pleased to have her discuss this important topic today, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Katrina. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> can you hear? Can you hear me? I okay. Can... Good. I'm not. I won't be on the commercial. Can you hear me now? I just. I just dated myself. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with Zoom. Um, I love that you are all in different parts of the country and the world, and we can all be here together as an MS community. So I thank you for joining me. I hate it because I can't see all of your faces and I do not like watching my own face, um, but here we are. Um, and I hope that we have some time at the end that I can see everybody's faces and we can have a Q and A. All right. So, the MS Foundation asked me to do this presentation um, and titled it Everything You Need to Know About MS and Living Your Best Life with Multiple Sclerosis. Now, I, I thought about this for a long time, and I'm going to apologize for everybody who is on right now that thinks that in this hour, I will answer every question and they will learn everything they need to know about MS. So I've worked with MS folks since 2003, and I still learn something about MS every day. Um, and maybe we can make this a 3000 part series where um, we can talk about all of the things we need to know. And I still learn something all of the time. Sometimes it's for my patients. I also do hundreds of hours of continuing education per year. Um, and thousands of practice hours. And so we're all in this together to learn everything together. Um, but here are some of the things that I've learned about living your life, best life with multiple sclerosis. Okay, so a couple things. First off, to live your best life with MS, you need to advocate for yourself. So we have to dispel a few myths. Your doctor and your provider does not know everything. They don't know everything about MS not about the rest of your life, and not about the rest of your health. Also, not all providers are created equal. Everybody is different, and everybody has a provider that will work better for them. So you need to find a doctor or a provider that you can work with. You also need to know the right questions to ask, and I'm gonna bring up some of those as we go along, because your doctor doesn't have time to get to everything, um, and so it's really important that you know what to ask and how to go about asking it. So I'll talk about that. Um, speaking of the, the doctors or providers don't know everything about MS, I learn things from patients every day. In fact, yesterday a patient came in and she had the coolest walker. I'd never seen anything like it. And it was, it was awesome. It had forearms that she could lean on. It folded in and out, had a chair, uh, a seat that she could sit on, um, lifted up uh, and down so she could stand up tall. And um, I love seeing new things like that. She told me where she got it and how to go about getting it. So also those that have MS, it's always good to network with each other. What can you learn from other people that have multiple sclerosis? Okay, so advocating yourself, know your MRI. 
This is so vitally important. Um, you might go in and they say, okay, you have MS. And you say, well, what, what does that mean? What does that mean to me? And then they, they say these things like enhancing lesion, non-enhancing lesion. So let's kind of talk about that. What does that mean? So when you go into an MRI machine and, you know, it makes all of those sounds and you're sitting there and going, okay, what is this? And they, and they get on and say, okay, this next one is going to be eight minutes. And this next sequence is going to be two minutes. What they're doing is it's a magnet and it's taking slices, different pictures through your brain and your spinal cord. And those tell us many different things about the multiple sclerosis. So the first is, is the T2. So multiple sclerosis is many, means many scars, many lesions, and T2 lesions are the overall total burden of multiple sclerosis. So your T2 lesions are your total number of scars. Now, um, there's kind of a misnomer. Some people think that these scars can only cause you symptoms if they're active. So active lesions are ones that when they take you out of the machine and they put that IV in and they put the medicine in and uh, take you out and they put you back in really quick, that's gadolinium. Now, gadolinium shows us if a lesion is active at that moment. So your body's own immune system is attacking your brain at that moment. Um, so demyelination is the body's own immune system attacking the nerves or the neurons, the protective coating of the nerves, the myelin, and causing the scars. So when the, the scars pick up gadolinium, that means that they're active. Now, active lesions may or may not cause symptoms. Inactive lesions also may or may not cause symptoms. But if you have a gadolinium enhancing lesion, that tells us that at that moment, your body's immune system is busy attacking your myelin. It can also attack your myelin in your spinal cord. So multiple sclerosis can affect your brain, your cervical spine, and your thoracic spine. Um, and these are a couple of pictures of lesions. So you can see here the brain lesions, um, the white spots here, and then on the spinal cord, the white spots. It should look all healthy and great, but where there are white spots, those are lesions. So I once heard a neurologist put it this way, and it really helped it make sense to me because new lesions can occur five to 10 times more frequently than new symptoms. Um, and uh, that, that was kind of confusing to me because wouldn't you think if, if you have this lesion, you, you would feel something. Well, think about your brain and your brain is about that is about this big. An adult brain weighs about three pounds. Um, think about your brain as a six lane highway. If you're driving down the highway and there's an accident in the far right hand lane and you're in the far left hand lane, you may not even feel that accident. It may not affect you at all. You might just zoom right on by. Those are like lesions in your brain. So if you get a lesion in the far right lane of the highway and you're in the far left lane, you probably won't even feel it. Think about the spinal cord as a two lane highway. Spinal cord's only about that thick only about that big. So if you get a lesion in your spinal cord, it really eats into the margins. So if you're on a two lane highway and there's a car accident in front of you, gosh darn, you're gonna feel that. You're gonna be caught in traffic and that signal may be backed up for miles. So people tend to feel spinal cord lesions more than they feel brain lesions, but both can cause symptoms. So here are some possible symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Now, as you read through these, you may notice that a lot of these are silent symptoms, meaning nobody can see them and nobody can feel them but you. You need to know that your silent symptoms are real and what you feel is real and you need to talk to your provider and the people around you about your symptoms. Now on here, this says 40% of people have fatigue. Um, uh, I got this from multiplesclerosis.net. 
more recent research shows that up to 80% of people with multiple sclerosis may have fatigue. And that might be their number one symptom of MS, which is really hard. It's hard to be tired. So as we go along, I have a couple things to talk about these symptoms and what we can do to help you live your best life with MS with the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. And again, the symptoms come from the damage um, that the immune system has caused on your brain and your spinal cord. So back to advocating for yourself. I have learned the hard way that when anybody has multiple sclerosis, everyone assumes that anything that is wrong with them is from MS. You broke your pinky, oh, it must be MS. You have trouble going to the bathroom, oh, it must be MS. It's not always from MS. So it's always important to ask your provider, your neurologist, your nurse practitioner, PA, hey, is this from MS or is there something else going on? Some new research has shown that um, comorbidities with multiple sclerosis, if they are untreated, the multiple sclerosis can actually be worse. So it's very important to treat depression, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, because treating those can actually help your MS status as well. So a couple other conditions that can cause symptoms that may mimic symptoms of MS, high blood pressure. High blood pressure can cause fatigue, headaches, dizziness. So you may be blaming multiple sclerosis for fatigue, um, but it actually might be your high blood pressure and treating the high blood pressure may help your fatigue get better. Same with headaches. You may be blaming headaches, but you get your blood pressure under control and the headaches can get better. Same with dizziness. Sleep apnea can cause fatigue and headaches. In fact, in my neurology clinic, if anyone comes in complaining about fatigue and headaches, the first question we ask them is, do you have sleep apnea? Do you snore? Are you getting enough rest at night? Because if we can treat the sleep apnea, the fatigue may get so much better. Also, cord compression, a bulging disc, something like that can cause numbness. And pelvic floor weakness can cause incontinence. I had a patient that for 15 years could not move her right arm and everybody assumed it was from MS. And then she transferred to a, a new neurologist and they did a C-spine MRI and they said, by gosh, by golly, you have, a, you have a disc that is bulging into your spinal cord and compressing your spinal cord. She had surgery to fix that and she can move her arm again. And it was amazing. And this whole time people had blamed multiple sclerosis for her inability to move her arm. I've had people tell me that they have been tired for years and years and years, and we finally do a sleep study, or they finally get a sleep study, and they get a CPAP, and they start breathing better at night, and they say, I've never been so awake and felt overall so much better in my life. And that wasn't even treating the MS. That was treating something else. Um, so always think about, is there something else going on that I could treat that could help me feel better? Educate yourself. So one of the really cool things about multiple sclerosis is all of the amazing services available to you. You didn't choose to get multiple sclerosis. Um, and so you should take advantage of resources available to you. I just watched ANOVA on PBS. Um, it was wonderful. I highly recommend it. It was called Predicting My Multiple Sclerosis. And this gentleman went through the risk factors of developing multiple sclerosis and how you may be one that develops multiple sclerosis. And he described multiple sclerosis as a bucket and then all of the risk factors for multiple sclerosis were glasses of water. And there were multiple risk factors. Now, if you just have one glass of water and pour it in the bucket, you may not develop multiple sclerosis, but if you have two and three and four, Eventually the bucket overflows and then you get multiple sclerosis. With that may come the symptoms of MS. And with the symptoms of MS, I highly recommend you use all of the resources available to you. So there's the Golden Parks Pass where you can get into all national parks for free. You just have to apply for it. There's Meals on Wheels where there are government services that can bring food to your home. 
There are transportation grants. If you have trouble walking, you can get grants to pay for Lyft, to pay for Uber, to pay for a bus so that you can get a bus ride so you can get where you need to go. Also, please use the handicap parking pass, even if you look okay. You only have so much energy in the day. People that have multiple sclerosis, it's like a battery. It's like the battery on your phone. It only has so much charge in the day. And once you've used up all of your charge for the day, you're done until you go to bed and you recharge or you plug in at night. I recommend you use your handicap parking pass so that you can park closer to the grocery store. So you can actually walk into the grocery store and use your energy to do your grocery shopping. Same with what if you're going to one of those NCAA basketball games and the parking is two miles away and you spend two miles walking in, your leg might be dragging and you may not be able to enjoy the game. Please park close, get a handicapped parking place to conserve your energy. Also, there are many exercise or support groups in your area. A silver lining to COVID is many of these are now available online or through YouTube. I have patients that are part of MS exercise groups. They log on once a week and there are their friends from around the country and around the world that they get to exercise with. And it's a great support system. Also, there are services through pharmaceutical companies. Um, medication to treat multiple sclerosis is very expensive. But nearly all of the pharmaceutical companies have copay assistance programs where you can get your medicine for free or for very low cost. You just have to ask. Please don't let your MS be a financial burden. Look into ways to help pay for your medicine and other things. There's also grants for cooling devices, MRIs, wheelchair ramps. The MS Foundation has amazing, awesome, cool grants. Also, scholarships for school. I see many young people who are diagnosed with multiple sclerosis either in high school or in their college age years, and they've been able to apply for scholarships to pay for their entire education. Please find out what's available to you and use it. Also advocate for yourself. Keep a running list of questions to be asked at your appointment and write them down. The likelihood is, is that whatever I wanna talk about at your appointment may be the same that you wanna talk about at the appointment, but if you have all the questions written down and I get a list of them right at the beginning of the appointment, I know how to manage my time and I know what your questions are and how to best get to them so that we can help you. Some people say they keep a list in their phone. So, you know, in their appointments button, they click appointments and then under notes, they um, write down all their questions. So it's right there in their appointment. Some people have a whiteboard, that way they and their significant other or their support system can also write down questions and then they take a picture of it and bring it in. Some people bring in a notebook and they have it written down. I love a list of questions and all of the prescribers that I know love the list of questions as well. That way we are sure we are taking care of you in the best way. Also, here are some questions to think about. So what can I expect from disease-modifying therapies? Why am I taking this medication? What do my MRI studies tell me and my provider? What does the contrast tell me? What does my MRI look like? How many lesions do I have? Where are the lesions? Are there any risks and side effects? So uh, something to think about with this question in particular, not only are there any risks and side effects of the medicines you're on, but what are the risks of MS? And what are your side effects of multiple sclerosis? And then we have a risk benefit ratio when we talk about what medicine is best for you in your specific situation. Also, is this medicine I'm using to treat a symptom of multiple sclerosis? Or is this medicine to treat the disease itself? When we treat multiple sclerosis, we have a handful of goals. But when we, there are kind of three that I always think about every time I see somebody. The disease modifying therapy, which is to slow the progression of the disease, slow disability, delay disability, and prevent new lesions from happening. 
Then we have our symptomatic medications. So those are separate from disease-modifying therapies. So symptomatic medications may be muscle relaxers. They may be things to help you wake up. They may be stimulants, but those are separate than your MS med. And then we have medications to treat relapses. So when you go in, when you're asking about what are the risks and side effects, not only of your disease-modifying therapy, your symptomatic medication, but also the disease itself. And then what about my other conditions and medications? And do any of them interact with each other? I'm on this cholesterol medicine. Is that good for my MS or bad for my MS? Does it interact with my MS medicine so I can't take both at once? These are questions to think about. Please always have a list of your medicines written down, including supplements. There are some supplements that are fantastic for MS and some I kind of want you to stay away from. There are also some supplements which may interact with your MS medication, so I don't want you on those. So please write down um, your supplements as well as your medicines to bring in every time you see your prescriber. I've seen people before and we can't figure out why are these liver enzymes elevated or what's going on with the kidney function. And gosh darn, it ends up being one of the supplements they're taking that they didn't realize. Um, And when we, if I know they're taking that supplement, then I can help assist with making things right again. Then also, what are the costs associated with this treatment? How much will it cost me? How much will it cost my insurance company? How much will the pharmaceutical company uh, chip in? What are the resources available in my community? Is there a support group here that you know of? here either either in your office or locally, and then where can I go to learn about my disease? I do not recommend Dr. Google. He has terrible bedside manner, and he will only tell you all of the bad things. So I always recommend my patients go to reputable websites and also books and resources to learn about the disease. Also advocate for yourself, learn the common MS terminology. You know, your, your prescriber may throw out big words like T2 hyperintensity, demyelination, Laramies, UTUS, all of these things. And you may feel like a deer in headlights, but if you educate yourself, then you feel prepared for what they're telling you. So one common thing people talk about is a Lermite sign. So a Lermite sign is when you bend your head forward you may get electric shocks up and down your spine. So what does that mean to you? What that means is that you have lesions in your spinal cord. Now, some people have alarmates forever and ever and ever. Some people only have alarmates when they're actively having an MS relapse or have a new lesion. So it's an important symptom to kind of keep check on. Another one is UTOFS phenomenon. So UTOFS phenomenon is when you get overheated all of your MS symptoms can get worse. Now, what are things that can cause your core body temperature to become overheated? Number one, a fever. I've had people tell me, I don't have symptoms of a UTI, except guess what happens? I stop walking because their core body temperature gets overheated because they have um, a fever. And then the way to treat that is not by treating the multiple sclerosis, it's by treating the fever. And once the fever goes down, the MS symptoms get better. When folks call our office and say, hey, I have, um, I'm having an MS relapse. The very first question I ask them is, do you have any signs or symptoms of infection? Do you have an infection right now, including COVID, the flu, whatever it may be? Because your MS symptoms may be worse, it may feel like a relapse, but it's not a true relapse. We need to treat the underlying infection, and once that gets better, your MS symptoms get better. This also, um, and I just saw a question come through, and I can't quite see it yet. I'll promise I'll get to it at the end. Um, uh, This also may happen with, if you go to your son's soccer tournament or your grandson's soccer tournament, and it's 85 degrees outside, and you get very, very hot. I've had people say, then I can't stand up and get back to the car. So it's really important that you keep your core body temperature cool from the inside and the outside. So drink lots of cool water, have ice chips for you to chip, uh, for you to uh, suck on and chew, have popsicles, cooling vests, cooling towels. Okay, I'm going to see if I can answer this Q&A, you guys. I don't know if I'm, um, okay, 
Uh, the question is, where can we find out about the National Parks Pass and Uber? So the MS Foundation has information about Uber. Check out their website. And the National Parks Pass, just Google um, the Golden Parks Pass multiple sclerosis and the information will be there. And then also a question came through about vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D, uh, I like my patients to have between the uh, ranges of 50 and 80. That's the level. Now, how much vitamin D do you need to take? That's different for everybody. So have your provider check your um, specific blood work and then make recommendations based on your blood work. And then back to UTOF phenomenon. So um, any way you can keep yourself cool. And now I know there are grants available for cooling devices, have the hand, have the hand fans, um, umbrellas over you when you're going outside. Whatever you can do to keep your core body temperature cool when it's hot outside, that'll make you feel better. And then also what's the difference in MRI lesions and what does that mean for me? Learn about the medications used to treat multiple sclerosis. Know the side effects of each medicine that you are being prescribed. And then know if the medicine is being used to treat your MS or a symptom of MS. And then what are the side effects of the one to treat your MS and the side effects of the one to treat the symptom of MS? And then how do you know if a medication is working or not? That's a really good question to ask um, when it's prescribed to you. How do I know if this medicine is working? How long do I give it? And uh, what am I gonna feel if it's working or what, if I'm, what am I gonna feel if it's not working? Okay, all right. So without me talking about specific medications, because I would never make recommendations for specific medications for people I haven't met, but what are some things we can do without medicine? So first let's talk about spasticity. So again, if we go back to that very first chart that I had with symptoms of MS, spasticity is a very common symptom of multiple sclerosis. So that can be a couple of things. Either it's a tightness when you're walking or tightness in your arm, or some people have, you know, they go reach uh, and it shakes. Um, it can also look, be cramps. So anything that could be spasm or spasticity. So stretch multiple times per day, especially before bed and first thing in the morning. And you know what? You may feel silly doing it out in public at first, but guess what? It'll help the spasticity. Lean up against the wall, sit on the edge of the bed. When you get into bed, lean forward and touch your toes. Um, there are plenty of amazing YouTube videos that talk about stretches and stretching alone can really help keep those muscles loose and lean. So we wanna stretch, stretch, stretch. Also apple cider vinegar before bed. Now be sure to, to dilute it. If you Google apple cider vinegar tea for spasms, there's some recipes. I don't believe that you should be drinking some straight up apple cider vinegar. I'm talking about, um, it's like a tablespoon apple cider vinegar in um, hot water with some honey. And I've had people swear that that helps their spasms at night. Also, Epsom salt soaks or lotions that can really help with the alkalinity in the blood and can really help um, you feel better. So if you're one of those people that a bath is too hot for you, you can even fill up a, a tub of water with some Epsom salt and soak your feet in it before bed. Not only does it feel good, but it can also help with those spasms. Exercise. And I know that's hard because you're like, well, I don't want to exercise because I'm spastic. I don't feel good. But exercise is so good for spasms and it's overall good um, for your MS as well. There's recent data that shows that exercise can promote remyelination and repair and increase oxygenation. Exercise is So how can we go about exercising? I have a few rules of thumb. Start low and slow. If you go out and try and run a five minute mile, the very first time you exercise, you're never gonna exercise again. If you haven't exercised in years, Maybe start with walking for 30 seconds on the treadmill. And then the next day, a minute. The next day, a minute 30 until you can slowly get up to five minutes. And then also make sure that you stretch before and after. And if you do that, you're already at 10 minutes of exercise. Before you know it and you slowly add on time, you're going to be at 30 to 50 minutes of exercise a day. Also, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate 
hydrate. If people are spastic, they're oftentimes dehydrated. Also, you can tolerate your MS medications better if you're hydrated. So 60 to 100 ounces of water a day is what I recommend for the hydration. And then also over-the-counter magnesium. The highest dose I recommend is 500 milligrams, but start low and slow. So 100 milligrams, if you do that for a couple of days and you tolerate it okay, then go up to 200 for a couple of days and so on until you get to 500. The most common side effect of magnesium is diarrhea. So if you start having diarrhea, it's likely from the dose of magnesium. So then take a step down to the next lowest dose and that should be your magic spot. I have a lot of folks that love magnesium because it kills two birds with one stone. If constipation is one of their symptoms of MS plus spasticity, they use magnesium at night and it can help both. Uh, also, symptom improvement without medication, sleep. Sleep is so vitally important. Let's go back to high school biology, fight or flight and rest and digest. When we're resting and we're sleeping, that's when cellular repair can occur. So a couple things with sleep to get good quality sleep. Go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. I know that's frustrating, but if you set your internal clock to do that, you'll get more restful sleep. Your body knows, oh, it's sleep time, I'm going to sleep, and then you're more awake during awake time. Keep your room cool. Also, don't look at screens an hour before bedtime. That is so hard this day and age because we have our screens in our hands, but put them away. Don't look at the phone, don't look at the computer, don't look at the iPad. You can lay in your bed and read, you can relax, you can do those foot soaks that I talked about, but the blue light and looking at the screens stimulates your brain so you don't wanna go to sleep. Also, try relaxation techniques or guided imagery. I firmly, firmly believe in those. Um, uh, there are some amazing YouTube apps that you can just um, turn on your phone and then turn it upside down and they can guide you through falling asleep. I have done them personally. I absolutely believe in them. I think they work and they're worth a try. And then have a bedtime routine. So you train your body. Okay, I take a shower before bed. I brush my teeth. My body knows it's time to start going to sleep. And then if you have trouble sleeping, you can try a, sleep, a sleepy time tea or warm milk and honey to try and calm your body down before bed. If pain is one of your symptoms, it's gonna it sound familiar, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Also exercise can really improve the pain. Also guided imagery or meditation. People may think I'm crazy when I say that, but I personally have uh, debilitating migraines. When I was pregnant, I didn't want to take anything for migraines <clears throat> because I was pregnant. So during my pregnancy, I used guided imagery and meditation to treat my migraines, and I swear it works. Um, also, massage. I've had people get off of medicines to treat pain with massage and stretching alone. If you have trouble with your gait, physical therapy can be very beneficial. If you don't use it, you lose it. Now, the nice thing about physical therapy is these folks are specially trained in how to help you. So they can really focus in on what muscle group you're having trouble with and help you build it back up again. Also, assistive devices. There is no shame in using a cane if you need one or a walker or a wheelchair. And then also an AFO, which is an ankle foot orthotic or other orthotics to help you walk better. Depression. Depression affects more than half of people with multiple sclerosis. There is data that shows that some people can improve their depression with therapy alone. Please seek out help. If you go to psychologytoday.com, there are lists of therapists and psychologists in your area. There is somebody available. There is somebody that can help you. Also, enjoy a hobby. Join a support group. And you know what? it's okay to ask for help. I once heard a therapist say, you're not lazy, you're just using all of your energy to survive. And sometimes it may feel like that with MS plus depression. So please ask for help. Also positive thoughts, wellness training, meditation, and mindfulness. 
So Dr. Kotri is an MS specialist that has been treating MS folks for years. And he wrote a book um, called Healing the Soul. And he told a story in the book. And now I've heard him tell this story. So I'm sure I'm telling it incorrectly. If you want to hear all the details, please look at his book. Um, but he tells the story of a patient that was part of a double blind, double placebo trial. Now, this person was not doing well with their multiple sclerosis before they were put on the trial medicine. When they got put on the trial medicine, I believe he said their lesions started to get better. They were able to start hiking again. They'd been using a cane and she dropped the cane. She was able to walk. It gave her her life back. And she said, this medicine has given me my life back. This is amazing. Now, when the trial ended, she had to stop the medicine while they were waiting for FDA approval. And she was fighting with the FDA. We need this medicine. This is a life-changing medicine. Um, I need it back. Well, um, right before the medicine was FDA approved, the people that led the trial were able to see who was on placebo and who was on the actual medicine. Dr. Cotri said he opened up the pamphlet and she was on placebo. So he called her and said, hey, guess what? That medicine that has changed your life, it was actually placebo. And she, he said she sat there for a minute and then said, well, I guess that's the power of positive thinking. What Dr. Cotri said is if you believe you're going to do well, you're going to do well. So be kind to yourself. Think positive thoughts. Know that you're going to do great and be, and be kind and you're going to do well. Also, constipation. I already brought up the magnesium. The eat foods high in fiber. Sometimes the American diet, it's hard um, to get good fiber. So you may have to go looking for it. Um, I don't know if any of you heard Dr. Co I mean, Dr. Ah, don't know if anybody of you heard Stephen Colbert's opening uh, monologue the other night. But he said, oh, they developed a new uh, risk factor for heart disease. It's one question. The question is, are you American? And if the answer is yes, you probably have heart disease. Because as Americans, we have a hard time getting whole healthy diets. So seek out whole healthy foods and food high in fiber. Also, hydrate well and try to go to the bathroom at the same time every day. A lot of people find if they bowel train and they uh, either drink coffee early in the morning or they have Miralax or something at night and they sit down on the toilet at nine o'clock every morning, they can train their bowels to go. So here is um, uh, how a normal bladder works. Now you can tell by all of the arrows, there's many things going on. Some muscles have to contract, others have to relax at the same time. Now when people have multiple sclerosis, there may be multiple different things involved, whether they're having spasms with the bladder contraction, with the muscle contraction, or the sphincter is um, spasming so it can't release like it should. And so oftentimes urine can get stuck in there, which can cause frequency, urgency, and it also increases the risk of bladder infections. So we need to train the bladder to work well. So what can we do? Hydrate. Now, if you fill that bladder up with lots of water and teach it to close all the way versus being chronically dehydrated, so it's just sitting there spasming like this, um, hydration can really work. Also, urinate every two hours. That may sound silly and you may feel like I'm not a toddler. I, why am I toilet training? But if you train your bladder that I'm going to sit down on the toilet and relax and empty every two hours, it can really help improve your bladder dysfunction. So you're not <gasps> waiting until it's too late and then having an accident. Also avoid food or drinks that irritate the bladder. If it's bad enough, you may need, um, bladder dysfunction can be complex and may require evaluation by a urologist for appropriate treatment. Some people need a catheter and that's okay. Um, also pelvic floor exercises. There are physical therapists that specialize in pelvic floor exercises and they can really help. And then again, the bladder training. Visual difficulties. I have to admit, I have been shocked as a nurse practitioner, how many people come in with blurred vision and we are, so we think, oh, it must be from MS and we send them to the ophthalmologist and it's from dry eye. 
So 95% of the time people are coming in with blurred vision, it's from dry eye. So if you're having visual trouble, start with some artificial tears and some lubricant eye drops. Um, if the trouble is actually your eyes communicating with your brain, visual therapy can make a world of difference. Also, if you're having a lot of trouble, you could meet with a, a neuro-ophthalmologist for some prescription lenses. Prisms might help, blue light might help. Um, there are many resources available there to help with the visual difficulties. Also, dizziness, you're gonna hear it again, hydration. Also, balance and vestibular therapy can make a big difference. These folks specialize in dizziness and can help train you and retrain your brain not to feel so dizzy. Or if it's coming from your inner ear, they can help correct that as well. And then this is another one. It may sound silly, but stand up slowly. Oftentimes you get dizzy because you're moving too fast. If you go sit on the edge of the bed, wiggle around, wiggle your toes, get things moving, or if you've been sitting in a chair for a couple hours, Sit up, move your feet around, head side to side, and then stand up slow. Um, that can really help decrease that dizziness. Also, fatigue. Okay, so what can we do about fatigue? First off, I talked before about charging your battery and everybody only has so much battery in the day. So we want to divide large projects into smaller projects that are more easy and manageable. Also, gather supplies in advance of an activity, like cooking or cleaning, so you don't have to run around finding supplies while you complete the task. Get all of the ingredients for that recipe all together and ready in front of you before you get going. If you know you're gonna be cleaning, get all of the, um, the things you need for cleaning or have your uh, support system bring it to you so that you're not having to run back and forth to get the items. You know, um, uh, some people say, well, I'm in a wheelchair. I, I can't do that. Well, what about folding laundry? Could you have your support system bring you the laundry and then you can fold it so that you can help? Um, ask for help so that you can um, help with the, so that you can do the activities as well. Plan your shopping list in advance. Um, there's also these amazing things like having your groceries delivered um, if you can, or you can do the pickup, the curbside shopping for the groceries, where you can sit and order the groceries on your phone or your computer and then just go pick them up. That can really help um, minimize fatigue. I love, uh, so Helpline recommended this and they said cook all your meals for the week at once. I think that's fantastic and I admire everybody that does that. But if you have the energy to do it and you know your family's home with you on Sunday and you all can get together and, and cook all of the food Sunday and have it all ready to go in the fridge, that can really help um, on the rest of the days of the week if you're tired by the end of the day. Also, organize your house so frequently used items are in easy to reach places so you don't have to climb up a ladder to get your paper towels and your um, wash rags are right in front of you where you can grab them. Use wheeled carts to transport heavier items around the house. Um, why waste all your energy lugging something heavy around or, or making multiple trips back and forth if you have a wheeled cart that you can just take it all with you? Make sure you have good lighting in your home so you're not straining to see things clearly. It can really cause fatigue if you're constantly trying to strain to see what's going on around you. Consider using adaptive devices for dressing, bathing, and household chores. Keep your house cool if your fatigue tends to get worse when it's warm. Run a dehumidifier if your fatigue tends to flare up in humid weather. And again, like I said before, use a handicap permit to park close to the building. And then also treat the other conditions that you have. Other conditions may worsen not only multiple sclerosis symptoms, but the brain volume itself. And we need as much brain volume as we can get when our body's immune system is trying to attack our brain. High cholesterol can contribute to lower brain volume. If you have high cholesterol, please treat it. High blood pressure and heart disease can lead to decreased gray matter in the brain. Obesity can increase T1 lesion volume. T1 lesions are black holes in multiple sclerosis or permanent loss of tissue. So 
please treat obesity if you have it. Thyroid disease is linked to decreased gray matter volume, and type 2 diabetes can cause decreased gray matter volume. I've had some people say to me, well, I'm so busy treating my MS, I can't take care of anything else. Guess what will kill you? A heart attack or a stroke. So please treat your high blood pressure, treat your high cholesterol. MS isn't the only thing you have, and your MS will be better off overall if you treat other conditions that you have. Rely on your support system. Delegate tasks. Again, I said it before, but it's okay to ask for help. And then also support your caregiver. You're relying on them and they're relying on you. So what are some ways you can support your caregiver? You know, say, hey, you've helped me a lot this week. Do you wanna go get a massage? Or have you had your nails done in a while? Do you wanna go do that? I'm good here. Um, whatever it is, ask your caregiver, what can I do to support you to keep that relationship? good and strong, whether that's your children, your spouse, your friends, your coworkers, whoever it is, you can delegate your tasks, you can ask for help, and then you also can support them. So since this is over Zoom, I'll get to this in a minute with any other ideas to share with others. So think about that since we're not in a live audience and um, when we open it up, people can share their thoughts with others. So in summary, educate and advocate for yourself, treat your symptoms of MS, treat other conditions that you may have, and utilize the resources available to you. The more you read, the more you know, the more you learn, the more places you will go. That is from Dr. Seuss. So I will end on that. And we can go ahead and open it up to questions. And now I fully admit I'm horrible at technology. So I might need help <laughs> for a lot of people while we're making this work. Great. Thank you so much, Katrina. That was wonderful. And I'm happy to read all the questions to you so you don't even have to do that. <laughs> but I, okay. I do have um, a question of my own. I'm not even just a question, but I know that when we were doing live educational programs and I would stand up in front of everyone telling them about the foundation and what we can do for them, you know, people would tell me about things that were wrong with them. And I'd say, look, I'm aging. And I believe that a lot of it has to do with age. And you can't blame, as you said, everything on MS. We have aches and pains that just go along with aging. So to, to say that everything we're having, all the aches and the pains and all of that is, is MS related is, is not right, right? So... Yeah, I just wanted to share that with you because I know everybody would go, oh, yeah, I guess that's yeah. right. You know, <laughs> it's not, yeah. we, we are entitled to aging pains also in addition to the MS. So, and Deborah, could you share some of the resources that the foundation has available for people? I know here in Salt Lake, when I tell people about the resources, oftentimes they don't know. Could you share some of those? Absolutely. Well, first of all, the very best thing to do for anybody that has access through their phone or the computer, because we have an amazing website that can tell them everything in detail, much more than I can do about every single one of the free programs and services that we offer. And that would just be to msfocus.org. msfocus.org. It's going to tell you every one of our free programs and services, but we have everything from, oh my goodness, we help with um, home care. If you're coming home from the hospital and you need a few hours of help, you know, to get on your feet again, or your caregiver needs some respite, we can do some of those hours. We have oh, health and wellness where we can help if you're uninsured. We can help pay for glasses and an eye exam or dental and some, you know, um, some appointments to the dentist. We have everything from assistive technology, helping with walkers and just everything. We can help people if they can't get their wheelchair through the, the doorway, because now they can't just walk through the doorway. Maybe we can help a little bit with trying to widen that for them or ramps or bars in the bathroom, or if your car needs tires and just everything. There's, there's so many daily critical needs that we can help with. 
Um, we have a wonderful support group system that Marsha Harris is in charge of all of that. And if you wanted to join a support group, we can do that. We have a library that is amazing, a library that people don't take advantage of. Not only can you order something to read, but we will give you a postage paid envelope to return it to us. <laughs> so, and we'll just keep sending you things. And there's a whole list of those type of items that you can ask for. Um, we have a Lyft program and an Uber program. If you need a Lyft ride or an Uber ride to your neurologist appointment or to an infusion appointment, we can get you there and back. And we give several of those. I mean, like, I think there's six round trips every year. So there's just a multitude of things that people, you're right, are not aware of and they're not taking advantage of. And it's simply because you have MS, you're entitled to use those. So I, I could go on and on and on, but Truly, I think uh, the best thing for somebody would to either be to call us or if they have access to the computer to just go on to the msfocus.org. It's in it, and it literally, we even have a 24 hour radio station where you could take your phone and listen to all these things. Look at all the teleconferences and the webinars now that are now on our YouTube channel that we never used to really do that. And now at, their, at your own leisure, you can go on when it's convenient to you and listen to you, Katrina Bodden, over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> That's a frightening uh, thought. We don't, we don't want that, but. <laughs> they might want yeah. to stop and start, yeah. stop and start. So yeah, we're, it's, yeah. it's wonderful. Thank you for asking that. I'm, I'm always happy to tell people what we do. Um, so we are ready for questions now. I see we have a couple there. Um, but let me explain to people how to do that for those that aren't familiar with it. So if you have a question or a comment, you can ask it using the Q&A button in the app, which also allows you to send your question anonymously if you choose. If you can ask your question live, or you can ask your question live by raising your hand, and to do so, you click the raise hand button or press the number nine if you're on the phone. I'll call on you and then you will be able to unmute to ask your question. So let's see. Let's go to the questions that we have. Um, with relapsing, remitting MS, are there supposed to be times when you don't have any symptoms? A good question. That's a really, that's a really good question. So, so the answer to that is yes, no. So that depends on your multiple sclerosis. So a couple, that's kind of a loaded question. So a couple things. Some people think if you have relapsing, remitting MS, when you're in a remission, you don't need to treat the MS. That is not correct. Even if you're in a relapse, you still need to treat the multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis is an immune system problem. And even if you're not feeling a relapse, your immune system may still be going after your brain and your spinal cord. So you still need to treat it. Now, some people have symptoms of MS that are always with them whether they're in remission or not. So they have fatigue, even if they're not in a relapse. They have tingling in their hands, even when they're not in a relapse. By definition, a multiple sclerosis relapse is a new or worsening symptom. So new or worsening symptom in the absence of illness, infection, or other trigger that lasts for 24 hours or greater. So really good question. There are some people that have MS that only have symptoms when they're in a relapse, and there are some people that have MS that have symptoms every day. Wow, do, um, Alicia, would, uh, Alicia would like to know, does being warm or too warm make MS potentially worse or start an inflammatory flare up, like on a hike or does it just, have, just make symptoms worse until you cool down? Correct, it's only making the symptoms worse. You are not doing damage to yourself you are not hurting yourself. You are not making your MS worse. It's just the symptoms getting worse. So you're not doing yourself harm. And I want you to go for a hike. Um, I think it's amazing. Just wear a cooling vest when you're doing it. Bring lots of water. And if you start to have those MS symptoms creep up on you, then take a break. Cools down. Um, and then hopefully when you cool down, they get better. And then you can continue on. Thank you. Ben asked, I'm changing neurologist from a regular neurologist to an MS specialist. What are some good questions to ask a new MS neurologist? And do I need to explain the change to my existing neuro? So no, you don't have to tell your existing neuro. 
no, you just want another opinion. You don't, they don't need to know. Just ask their front desk for your records. Then the new neurologist, and I'm very glad you're seeing an MS specialist because they work with MS all day, every day. They know all of the ins and outs. So MS specialists can be a really good friend. So a couple of things to ask them. How do I know if my MS medicine is working for me? Am I on the right MS medicine? Do I need a new MRI? What type of MS do I have? How do I know if my medicine is working? So if after this is reposted, if you go back to that original list of questions, I have a whole list that I would recommend you ask your new neurologist. Great. Um, Courtney would like to know, is vitamin B12 a good vitamin to take if you are a pescatarian that's dairy free? Absolutely. So I actually recommend everybody that have MS uh, take vitamin B12. So what's interesting about vitamin B12 is there are some people that hypothesize that people that have MS can't get vitamin B12 from your bloodstream into your central nervous system as easily as people that don't have MS. And I don't know exactly why that is, but I also see that people that have MS tend to have a really low vitamin B12 anyway. So um, it, it's a known fact that if you have one autoimmune disease, you may have uh, two or three or four and low vitamin B12 can be an autoimmune issue. So if you throw diet on there, you're vegan or best pescatarian, you're going to have a harder time getting B12. So here's another thing with B12. It's a water soluble vitamin, which means you pee off the excess, which means it's very difficult, if not near impossible to overdose on B12 with, with supplementation and diet. So I highly, highly, highly recommend that you get a baseline B12 level, see what your B12 level is, and then supplement. And if it's high, it's okay. You're P is just a little more expensive than it was before, but you're going to be getting that vitamin B12 from your bloodstream into your central nervous system. Also, 50% of people lack the intrinsic factor needed to absorb oral vitamin B12. So what that means is that you have to get your B12 from sources other than swallowing it and going through your stomach. So if you're going to spend the money buying a supplement over the counter, I recommend a liquid that is a dropper under your tongue or a pill that's dissolvable that you put under your tongue. So then it's absorbed under your tongue. There's also prescription B12 that can be B12 injections, or there's even prescription nasal B12 as well. Um, so I highly recommend everybody with MS uh, take B12. Yes. Wonderful. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I keep thinking about something you talked about regarding uh, caregivers and the relationship between you and your caregiver and, you know, telling them what your needs are. And I, I think the trend is actually turning into referring to them as care partners, right. Instead of caregivers. And I right. quite like that. Right. Because I, although most of us say caregivers, cause it's something we've always done, but I really like yeah. the idea of the care partner because then yeah. You know, their feelings do matter. Your feelings do matter. And if you think of it more mm -hmm. as a partnership and, and not so much of just the giving, 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 but if we can actually consider possibly making it more of a partnership where our feelings do both matter, then I think people right. would be quite estranged. It would be, uh, you know, just more equitable in a way. Yeah. So I yeah. don't know. I was thinking of that as we were talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is why I said, ask your person, your people, what they need too, because it's a, it's a two-way street depending on, you know, your situation. I like that when you said it. So let's give everybody a couple seconds if we have any more questions. I saw, let's see. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. Nope. I think that's it. Everyone must have gotten all the information they need. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our time. If you missed any part of this conference, it has been recorded and will be available through the MS Focus Facebook and YouTube channels. Reply to your registration email for information on how to accept, access recordings or sign up for our newsletter to learn about upcoming events. Our next teleconference will be Monday, which is this coming Monday, March 21st at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern. MS certified nurse Sherry Bins will be moderating a wonderful panel of advocates. 
that are going to share with you all the different ways you can advocate for yourself and the MS community. Our sincere thanks once again to Biogen, Genentech, Novartis, EMD Serono, Sanofi, Beatrice, and Bristol Myers Squibb for their generous support, and to all of our attendees for your participation. A very special thank you to our guest, Katrina Bowden, for taking time out of your very busy schedule, I'm sure, and for sharing all this wonderful information with us today. We greatly appreciate each one of you that are here today filling out your post-event survey, which is gonna be available to you as soon as you leave the meeting. Your participation in the survey will greatly help us in creating meaningful programming for the MS community. Goodbye, everyone, and we look forward to seeing all of you once again. Bye, thank you, Katrina. Bye. Thank you.